Today, I'm going to be reading Chapter 1 of Hiroshima by John Hersey. This chapter is titled, A Noiseless Flash. Let's get into it. At exactly 15 minutes past 8 in the morning, on August 6, 1945, Japanese time, at the moment when the atomic bomb flashed above Hiroshima, Mr. Shio Sasaki, a clerk in the personal department of East Asia Tin Works, had just sat down at her place in the plant office and was turning her head to speak to the girl at the next desk. At the same time, at the same moment, Dr. Masaku Fuji was settling down cross-legged to read the Oshio Asha on the porch of his private hospital, overhanging one of the seven Deltic rivers which divide Hiroshima. Miss Hatsu Nakamura, a tailor's widow, stood by the window of her kitchen, watching a neighbor tearing down his house because it lay in the path of an air raid defense fire lane. Father Wilhelm Kleinsorg, a German priest of the Society of Jesus, reclined in his underwear on a cot on the top floor of his order's three-story mission house. Reading a Jesuit magazine, Stimmen der Zet, Dr. Defrum Sasaki, a young member of the surgical staff of the city's large modern Red Cross hospital, walked along one of the hospital corridors with a blood specimen for a Wasserman test in his hand. And the the Reverend Mr. Koshio Tanimoto, pastor of Hiroshima Methodist Church, passed at, at the door of a rich man's house in Koi, the city's western suburb, and prepared to unload a handcart full of things he had evacuated from the town in fear of the massive B-29 raid, which everyone was expecting Hiroshima to suffer. A hundred thousand people were killed by the atomic bomb, and at least six were, and these six were among the survivors. They still wonder why they lived and so many others died. Each of them counts many small items of chance or violation. A step taken, a step taken, eaten time, decision to go indoors, catching one streetcar instead of the next. That spared him. And now each knows that in the act of survival, he lived a dozen lives and saw more death than he ever thought he would see. At the time, none of them knew anything. The Reverend Mr. Tanimoto got up at five o'clock that morning. He was alone in the parsonage because for some time his wife had been commuting with her year-old baby to spend nights with a friend in Yushida, a suburb to die north. Of the important cities of Japan, only two, Kodo and Hiroshima, <clears throat> had not been visited in strength by B-San, or Mr. B, as the Japanese. <clears throat> With a mixture of respect and hum and happy familiarity, called the B-29, and Mr. Tanimoto, like all his neighbors and friends, was almost sick with anxiety. He had heard uncomfortably uncomfortable details accounts of mass raids on Kir, Awankun, and Takayama, and other nearby town and other nearby towns. He was for, he was sure Hiroshima turn would come soon. He had slept badly that the night before because. There had been several air raid warnings. Hiroshima had been getting such warnings almost every night for the, for weeks. For at the time, the B-29s were using Lake Abibiwa, northwest of Hiroshima, as a revisionary point. And no matter what the city of the Americans planned to hit, the super fortresses streamed in over the coast near Hiroshima. The frequency of the warnings and the and continued abstinence of Mr. B with respect to Hiroshima had made its citizens jittery. A rumor was going around that the Americans were saving something special for the city. Mr. Tanimoto is a small man, quick to talk, laugh, and cry. He wears his black hair parted in the middle and rather long, the prominence of the frontal bones just above his eyebrows and the smallness of his mustache, mouth, and chin gave him a strange, old look, boyish, yet wise, weak, yet fiery. He moves nervously and fast, but with a restraint which suggests that he is cautious. He's a cautious, thoughtful man. He showed, indeed, just those qualities in the uneasy days before the bomb fell. Besides, having his wife spend the nights in Yoshida, Mr. Tanimoto had been carrying all portable things from his church in the close-packed residential district called Nargawana. 
to a house that belonged on the Rayan manufacturer in Koi. Two miles from the center of town, the Rayan man at Mr. Matsui, Mr. Matsui had opened his uncomputing estate to a large number of his friends and acquaintances so that they may evacuate whatever they wish to, safe, to a safe distance from the probable target area. Mr. Tinamoto had no dif- difficulty in moving chairs, hymnals, Bibles, altar gear, and church records by push by a by push cart himself. But the organ console and an umbrella piano required some aid. A friend of his named Matsui, Matsu, had the day before helped him get the piano out to Koi Kajoi in return. He had promised that day to assist Mr. Masu, Matsui in hauling out the daughter's belongings. This is why he had risen so early. Mr. Tanimoto cooked cooked his home breakfast. He felt awfully tired. The effort of moving the piano the day before, a sleepless night, weeks of worry, and an unbalanced diet, the cares of his parish all combined to make him feel hardly adequate to a new day's work. There was another thing, too. Mr. Tanimoto had studied theology at Elmore College in Atlanta, Georgia. He had graduated in 1940. He spoke excellent English. He dressed in American clothes. He had corresponded with many American friends right up to die time. The war began in among a people obsessed with fear of being spied upon, perhaps almost obsessed himself. He fought. He found himself growing increasingly uneasy. The police had questioned him several times, and just a few days before, he had heard that an influential acquaintance a uh, Mr. Tanaka, required officer of Toyin Kishin Kasha Streamline, and an anti-Christian, a famous man in Hiroshima for his showy philanthropies and notorious for his personal tyrannies. He had been telling people that Tanimoto should not be trusted in, com- in compensation to show himself publicly a good Japanese. Mr. Tanimoto had taken on the chairmanship of his local Tamagarui of, or Neighborhood Association, and to his other duties and concerns, this position had been added to the business of organi- uh, organizing area defense for about 20 families. Before 6 o'clock that morning, Mr. Tanimoto started for Mr. Magazui's house. There he found that their burden was to be a, t- a Tanzu, a large Japanese co- cabinet full of clothing and household goods the two men sat out the morning was perfectly clear and so warm that the day promised to be uncomfortable a few minutes later after they started the air raid siren went off a minute-long blast that warned of approaching planes but indicated to people of Hiroshima only a slight degree of danger since it sounded every morning at this time when an American weather plane came over the two men pulled and pushed the handcart through the city streets. Hiroshima was a, a fan-shaped city, lying mostly on six islands formed by the seven Ashrul rivers that branch out from the Ojo, uh, Oda River. Its main commercial and residential districts, covering about four square miles in the center of the city, contained three-quarters of its population, which had been reduced by several evacuation programs from wartime peak of about 380,000 to about 245,000. Factories and other residential districts or suburbs lay compactly around the edges of the city. To the south were docks and airport and an island studded inland sea. A rim of mountains runs around the other three sides of the delta. Mr. Tanimoto and Mr. Matsui took their way through the shopping center, already full of people, and across two of their rivers to the sloping streets of Koi, and then and up them to the outskirts and foothills. As they started up a valley away from the tight ranked houses that all clear sounded, the Japanese <clears throat> the Japanese radar a uh, reconnaissance. Pushing the handcart up to the Rayan's man's house was tiring, and the men, after they had maneuvered their load into a driveway and to the front steps, paused to rest a while. They stood with a wing of the house between them and the city. Like most homes in this part of Japan, the house consisted of wooden frames and wooden walls supporting a heavy tile roof. Its front hall, packed with rolls of bedding 
and clothing looked like a cool cave full of fat cushions. Opposite the house, to the right, to the right of the front door, there was a large, finicky rock garden. There was no sound of planes. The morning was still. The place was cool and pleasant. Then a tremendous flash of light cut across the sky. Mr. Tim Tanamoto has a distinct recollection that it traveled from east to west, from the city toward the hills. It seemed a sheet of sun. Both he and Mr. Mitsui reacted in terror, and both had the time to react, for they were about 3,500 uh, 3, yards, or two miles from the center of the explosion. Mr. Matsui dashed up the front steps into the house and dived among the bedrolls and buried himself there. Mr. Tenomoto took four or five steps and threw himself between two big rocks in the garden. He bellied up very hard against one of them as his face was against the stone. He did not see what happened. He felt a sudden pressure and then splinters and pieces of board and fragments of tile fell on him. He heard no roar. Almost no one in Hiroshima recalls hearing any noise of the bomb. But a fisherman in his sam top on the inland near Tezui, the man lived with whom Dr. Tenomoto's mother-in-law and sister-in-law were living, saw the flash and heard a tremendous explosion. He was nearly 20 miles from Hiroshima, but the thunder was greater than when the B-29s hit Awakna, only five miles away. When he dared, Mr. Tanamoto raised his head and saw the Ryan man's house had collapsed. He thought a bomb had fallen direct directly on it. Such clouds of dust had risen there was a sort of a, a twilight around. In panic, not thinking for a moment of Mr. Matsu running under the ruins, he dashed out into the street. He noticed as he ran the concrete wall of the estate had fallen over toward the house rather than away from it. In this street, the first thing he saw was a squad of soldiers who had been burrowing into the hillside <clears throat> opposite, hillside opposite, making one of the thousands of dugouts in which the Japanese apparently intended to resist invasion. Hill by hill, life for life, the soldiers were coming out of the hole the <clears throat> where they should have been safe, and blood was running from their heads, chests, and back. They were all silent and dazed. Under what seemed to be a local dust cloud, the day grew darker and darker. At nearly midnight, th the night before the bomb was dropped, an announcer on the city's radio station said that about 200 B-29s were approaching southern Hishudu and advised the population of Hiroshima to evacuate to their designated safe areas. Mrs. Hatsui Nakamura, the tailor's widow, who lived in the section called Nobora Cho, who had, who had long had a habit of doing as she was told, got her three children, a 10-year-old boy, Toshio, and an 8-year-old girl, Yakio, and 5-year-old girl, Makio, out of bed and dressed them and walked with them, with them to the military area as the East Parade Ground on the northwest edge of the city. Where there she unrolled some mats and the children lay down on them. They slept until about two, and when they were awakened by the roar of planes going over Hiroshima. As soon as the planes had passed, Miss Nakamura started back with her children. They reached home a little after 2.30, and she immediately turned on the radio, which, to her distress, was just then broadcasting a fresh warning. When she looked at her children and saw how tired they were, and when she thought of the number of trips that they had made in the past weeks, all to no purpose, to the East Parade Ground, she decided that in spite of all the destructions on the radio, she simply sh could not face starting out all over again. She put the children in their bedrolls on the floor, lay down herself at three o'clock, and fell asleep at once, so soundly that when the planes passed over later, she did not waken to their sound. The siren had jarred her awake, at about seven, she arose, dressed quickly, and hurried to the house of Dr. Nakamura, or Nakamoto, the, the head of the neighborhood association, and asked him what she should do. He said that she should remain at home unless an urgent warning, a serious of intermediate blast of the siren, was sounded. She returned home, lit the stove in the kitchen, 
get set some rice to cook and sat down to read the that morning's Hanshu Taku Chakugora Chakugoku. To her relief, the all clear sounded at eight o'clock. She heard the children stirring, so she went and gave each of them a handful of peanuts and told them to stay on their bedrolls because they were tired from the night's walk. She had hoped that they would go back to sleep, but the the man in the house directly to the south began to make a terrible hablu of hammering, wedging, ripping, and splitting. The prefecto government convinced, as everyone in Hiroshima was, that the city would be attacked soon, had begun to press with threats and warnings for the completion of wide fire lanes, which, it was hoped, might act in the conjunction with rivers to localize any fires started by the incendiary raid, and the neighbor was reluctantly sacrificing his home to the city, sa- the city's safety. Just just the day before the prefectory, prefect had ordered all able-bodied girls from the secondary school to spend a few days helping to clear these lanes, and they started work soon after the all-clear sounded. Miss Nakamura went back to the kitchen, looked at the rice, and began watching the man next door. At first, she was annoyed with him, annoyed with him for making so much noise, but then she was moved almost to tears by pity. Her emotion was specifically directed toward her neighbor, tearing down his home, board by board. At the time when there was so much unavoidable destruction, but undoubtedly she felt a generalized community, ge- generalized community pity. To say nothing of self-pity, she had not had an easy time. Her husband, Aswari, had gone into the army just after Miko was born, and she had heard nothing from him or of him for a long time, until on March 5th, 1942, she received a seven-word telegram as who had died an honorable death at Singapore. She learned that that he had died on February fifteenth, uh, the day Singapore fell, and that he had been corporal. Aswada had not been had been a not particularly prosperous tailor, and his only capital was Suzuki sewing machine. After his death. When his allotments stopped coming, Miss Nakamura got out the machine and began to take in piecework herself. And since the supported, and since then had supported the children, but poorly by sewing. As Miss Nakamura stood watching her neighbor, everything flashed whiter than any white she had ever seen. She did not notice what happened to the man next door. The reflex of the mother set in motion toward her children. She had taken a single step. The house was 1,350 yards or three-quarters of a mile from the center of the explosion when something picked her up and and she seemed to fly into the next room over the raised sleeping platform pursued by parts of her house. Timbers fell all around as she landed, and the shower of tiles plummeted her deeply. She rose up and freed herself. She heard a, a child, a mother, help me. We and saw her youngest, Miko, the five-year-old, buried to her breast and unable to move as Miss Nakamura started frantically to claw her way toward the baby as she could or hear nothing of other children. In the days right before the bombing, Miss Nakamura Fuji began prospering and dynastic and at the time not too busy and had been allowed himself the luxury of sleeping until 9 or nine or 9.30, but fortunately he had to get up early. The morning of the bomb was dropped to see a house, to see a house guest off on a train. He rose at six and a half hour later, walked with his friend to the station, not far away across the rivers. He was back home by seven. Just as the siren sounded, it sustained warning he ate breakfast, and then, be- because the morning was already hot, undressed down to his underwear and went out on the porch to read the paper. This porch, in fact, the whole building, was curiously constructed. Dr. Fuji, the property of a peculiar Japanese institution, a private single doctor, hospital. This building, perched beside and over the water of Kayo River, And next to the bridge of the same name contained 30 rooms for 30 patients and their kingfolk. For according to the Japanese custom, when a person falls sick and goes to the hospital, 
one or more members of his family go and live there with him to cook for him, bathe, massage, and read to him, and, uh, and to offer incense fil familial sympathy, without which a Japanese patient would be miserable indeed. Dr. Fuji had no beds, only straw mats for his patients. He did, however, have all sorts of modern equipment, an x-ray machine, dithria apparatus, and a fine tiled laboratory. The structure rested two-thirds on the land, one-third on, on piles over tidal waters of Kaya. This overhang, the part of the building where Dr. Fuji lived, was queer-looking, but it was cool in the summer, and from Dai Porch, which uh, faced away from the center of the city. The prospect of the river, with pleasure boats drifting up and down, was always refreshing. Dr. Fuji had occasionally had anxious moments when the Oda and its branches rose to flood, but piling was apparently firm enough, and the house had always held. Dr. Fuji had relatively idle for a month, because of, in July, as the number of untouched cities in Japan dwindled, and as the Hiroshima seemed more and more inevitable a target, he began turning patients away on the ground that in case of a fireweed, he would not be able to help to evacuate them. Now he had only two patients left, a woman from Yeno, injured in die, injured in die shoulder, a young man of 25 recovering from burns he had suffered when the steel factory near Hiroshima which he worked had been bit. Dr. Fuji had six nurses to tend his patients. His wife and children were safe. His wife and one of the sons were living outside Ashuka, Ashaka, and another son and two daughters were in the country in Kishuda. A niece was living with him and a maid and a manservant. He had little to do and did not mind, for he had saved some money. At 50, he was healthy, Convital and calm, and was pleased to pass the evening drinking whiskey with friends. Always sensible, and for the sake of conversation, before the war, he had affected brands imported from Scotland and America. Now he was perfectly satisfied with the best Japanese brand, Suntory. Dr. Fuji sat down cross-legged in his underwear on the spotless matting of the porch, put on his glasses, and started reading the Ashoka Asha. He liked to read the Ahsoka news because his wife was there. He saw the flash to him, faced away from the center, and was looking at his paper. It seemed a brilliant yellow. Star startled, he began to rise to his feet. In the moment, he was about 1,550 yards from the center. The hospital, leaning behind his rising, and with a terrible ripping noise, toppled into the river. The doctor, still in the act of getting to his feet, was thrown forward and around and over. He buffeted and gripped. He lost track of everything because things were speeding up. He felt the water. Dr. Fuji hardly had time to think that he was dying before he realized he was alive, squeezed tightly by two long timbers in a V across his chest, like a morsel suspended between two huge chopsticks, held upright so that he could not move, and with his head miraculously above water, his torso and legs in it. The remains of his, of his hospital were all around him in a mad assortment of splintering lumber and materials for relief of pain. His shoulder, his left shoulder hurt terribly. His glasses were gone. Father Wilhelm Kleinsorg of the Society of Jesus was, on the morning of the explosion, in rather frail condition. The Japanese wartime diet had not sustained him, and he felt the strain of being a foreign in an increasingly xenophobic Japan. Even a German, since the defeat of the fatherland, was unpopular. Father Kleinsorg had, at 38, the look of a boy growing too fast. Thin in the face, with a prominent Adam's apple, a hollow chest, dangling hands, big feet. He walked, he walked clumsily, leaning forward a little. He was tired all the time. To make matters worse, he had suffered for two days along with Father Klesik, a fellow priest from a rather painful and urgent diarrhea, which they blamed on the beans and black ration bread they were obligated to eat. Two other priests then living in the mission compound, which was the Nobori Cho section, Father Superior Lasali and Father Schiffler, had escaped this affliction.
Father Kleinsword woke up about six in the morning the bomb was dropped, and a half an hour later he was a bit tardy because of the sickness he began to read. Mass in the mission chapel, a small Japanese-style wooden building, which was without pews since its worshippers knelt on the usual Japanese matted floor. Facing an altar graced with splendid skill, silks, brass, silver, and heavy embroideries, this morning, on a Monday, the only worshippers were Mr. Tanamoto, a theological student living in the mission house, Dr. Fukai, the secretary of the diocese, Mrs. Mirkata, the mission's devo- devoutly Christian housekeeper, and his fellow priests. After Mass, while Father Clansword was reading the prayers of thanksgiving, the siren sounded. He stopped the service, and the missionaries retired across the compound to the bigger building. There, in his room on the ground floor, to the right of the door, Father Clansword changed into a mili- milita- military uniform, which he had, had acquired when he was teaching at the Raku Middle School in Kobe and what she wore during the air raid fruits. After the an alarm, Father Kleinsorg always went out and scanned the sky. And in this instance, when he stepped outside, he was glad to see only the single weather plane that flew over Hiroshima each day about this time. Satisfied that nothing would happen, he went in and breakfast and breakfasted with the other followers on the subs- uh, on some stewed coffee and ration bread which under the circumstances was especially repugnant for, to him. The father sat, sat and talked a while until at eight they heard that the all clear. They went then to the various parts of the building. Father Shifley retired to his room to do some writing. Father Shislik sat in his room in a straight chair with a pillow over his stomach to ease his pain and read. Father Superior Lasalle stood at the window of his room, thinking Father Kleinsberg went up to the room on the third floor, took off all his clothes except his underwear, and stretched out the right side on the cot, and began reading his sermon desit. After the terrible flash, which Father Kleinsberg later realized, reminded him of something he as a boy about a large meteor colliding with the earth. He had the time, since he was 1,400 yards from the center, for one thought, a bomb is falling directly on us. Then for a few seconds or minutes, he went out of his mind. Father Kleinsork never knew <clears throat> how he got out of his uh, out of the house. The next thing he was conscious, the next thing he was conscious was when he was wandering around in the mission's vegetable garden in, in his underwear, bleeding slightly from a small cuts along his left flank. That all the buildings around had fallen down except the Jesuits' mission house, which had been long before the braced and double braced by a priest named Gropper, who was terrified of earthquakes. The day had turned dark, and that Maduraka San, the housekeeper, was nearby crying over and over. Shashuin Chang Tomada, our Lord Jesus, have pity on us. On the train, on the train, on the way into Hiroshima, from the country where he lived with his mother, Dr. Tafroom Sasaki. The Red Cross surgeon thought of over an unpleasant nightmare he had thought of before. His mother's home was Mukahara, 30 miles from the city, and it took him two, two hours by train and tram to reach hospital to reach Dai Hospital. He had slept uneasily all night and had wakened in, in, an hour earlier than usual and feeling sluggish and slightly feverish, had debated whether to go to the hospital at all. His sense of duty finally forced him to go, and he had started out on an earlier train than most mornings. The dream had particularly frightened him because it was so closely associated, on the surface at least, with disturbing actuality. He was only 25 years old and had just completed his training at the Eastern Medical University in Tenzigo, China, he was something of an idealist and much distressed by an integrity of medical facilities in the country town where his mother lived. Quite on his own and without a permit, he had begun visiting a few sick people out of there in the evenings after his eight hours at the hospital and four hours commuting. He had recently learned that the penalty for practicing without a permit was severe. A fellow doctor whom had asked about it had given him serious scolding. Nevertheless, he had continued to practice in his dream and had been at the bedside of a country patient which the police and doctor had consulted into the room, seized him, dragged him outside, and beat him up cruelly. On the train, he just, as, 
He just about decided to give up work in Mukahara since he felt that it would be impossible to get a permit because the authorities would hold him with the hold that it would conflict with his duties at the Red Cross Hospital. At the terminus, he caught a streetcar at once. He later calculated that if he would have taken his customary train that morning, and if he would have waited a few minutes for a streetcar, as often happened, he would have surely been close to the center of the explosion and surely would have perished. He arrived at the hospital at 7.40 and reported to the chief surgeon. A few minutes later, he went into a room on the first floor and drew blood from an arm of a man to in, in order to perform a Wasserman test. The laboratory containing the incubators for the test was on the third floor with the blood specimen in his hand. Left hand. Walking in a kind of distracted he had felt all morning, probably because of the dream and his restless night, he started along the main corridor on his way toward the stairs. He was one step beyond an open window when the flash of light of the bomb was reflected like a gigantic, gigantic photographic flash in the corridor. He ducked down on one knee and said to himself, as the only Japanese world, Can Gaska Gambre, he be brave. Just then, the building was about 1,650 yards from the center. The blast ripped through the hospital. The glasses he was wearing on his face flew off his face. The bottle of blood crashed against one wall. His Japanese slippers zipped out from under his feet, but otherwise, thanks to where he stood, he was untouched. Dr. Sasaki shouted the name of this chief surgeon and rushed around to, around to the man's office and found him terribly cut by glass. The hospital was in a horrible confusion. Heavy portions and ceilings had fallen on patients. Beds had overturned. Windows had f blown in cut people. Blood was splattered on walls and floors. Instruments were everywhere. Many of the patients were running about screaming. Many more lay dead. A colleague working in the laboratory to which Dr. Sasaki had been walking was dead. The Dr. Sasaki patient, whom he had just left at, and who a few minutes who a few moments before he had dreadfully afraid of a syphilis was also dead. Dr. Sasaki found himself the only doctor in the hospital who was unhurt. Dr. Sasaki believed that the enemy had hid only the building he was in, got bandages and began to bind the wounds of those inside the hospital. While outside, all over Hiroshima, maimed and dying citizens turned their uneasy steps toward the Red Cross Hospital to begin an invasion that was to make Dr. Suzuki forget his private nightmare for a long, long time. Miss Toshio Sasaki, the East, the East Asian tin work clerk, who was not related to Dr. Sasaki, got up at 3 o'clock in the morning on the day the bomb fell. There was extra housework to do. The, her 11-year-old brother, uh, Akio, had come out during the day before with a serious stomach upset. Her mother had taken him to Tam Takumura Pediatric Hospital and was staying there with him. Mrs. Saki, who was about 20, had to cook breakfast for her, for her father, a brother, a sister, and herself. And since the hospital, because of war, was unable to provide food to prepare, to prepare the whole day's meals for her mother and the baby. In time for her father, who worked in a factory making rubber earplugs for artillery clues, to take food by his way to the plant when she had finished and cleaned and put away the cooking things. It was nearly seven. The family lived in Koi, and she had about a 45-minute trip to the tin works in a section of town called Kamumachi. She was in charge of the personal records in the factory. She left Koi at seven, and as soon as she reached the, the plant, she went with some of the other girls in the personal department to Dye Factory Auditorium. A prominent local Navy man, a former employee, had committed suicide the day before throwing himself under the, a train, a death considerably honorable, enough to warrant a, a memorial service, which had, had, was to be held at the tin works at 10 o'clock the morning, in which the large hall, Miss Sasaki, and the others made suitable preparations for the meeting. This work took about 20 minutes. Mrs. Saki went back to her office and sat down at her desk. She was quite far from the windows, which were off to her left, and behind her were a couple of tall bookcases containing all the books of the factory library, which the personal department had organized. She just settled herself at her desk and put some things in the drawer and shifted papers. She thought 
that before she began to make entries in her list of new employees, discharges, and departures for the army, she would chat for a moment with a girl at her right. Just as she turned her head away from the windows, the room was filled with a blinding light. She was paralyzed by fear. Fixed in her chair for a long moment, the plant was one thousand. The plant was one thousand six hundred yards from the center. Everything fell, and Miss so Sasaki lost consciousness. The ceiling dropped suddenly, and the wooden floor above collapsed in splinters. And people up there came down the roof and gave way. But principally, first of all, the bookcases. Right behind her, swooped forward, and the contents threw her down. Her leg, her left leg, horribly twisted and breaking underneath her. There, in the tin factory, the first moments of the atomic age, a human was crushed by books. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed listening. Thank you.